Well, good morning, refuge. You guys doing all right this morning? Amen. So good to see you guys. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, I'm just so in awe of the presence of God that I sense in this place today. God, it's nothing I can do without you, and I don't want to. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to come. You're already here. Just make us aware of your presence and what you want to do and speak to us today. So grateful for a house that honors your word and your truth. So, God, we pray as I yield myself to you that your voice would speak through me and not my own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all excited about Jesus this morning? Amen. Y'all look amazing. This was an amazing Sunday last Sunday. Sean Smith, how many of you guys enjoyed that message from Sean Smith last week? To all the fathers, man, I just want to tell you I'm so grateful for every tie, undergarment, or pair of socks that you had. I just want to tell you that. Thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed my Father's Day as well. Hey, listen, we're in week three of our History Makers series. In week one, Pastor Clay shared this statement. Simple obedience changes history. In week two, Pastor Jay made another powerful statement. He says, the kingdom of God is not primarily comprised of superstars. It is made up of common people who say yes to simple assignments and opportunities. When when I think about people who have impacted the kingdom of God and the world, I'm not attracted to a resume. I'm attracted to their history with God. I believe that history makers are ordinary, everyday people who operate in radical obedience. One simple act of obedience has the potential to shift the trajectory of history. Now, there are three people that come to mind when I think about history makers. They're not often talk about history books don't credit them for making monumental advancements of any cause, yet I believe that their simple acts of obedience have and are changing history. Nine months before Rosa Parks' famous act of civil disobedience, there was a 15-year-old girl by the name of Claudette Colvin. She was arrested on March the 2nd, 1955, for refusing to give up her seat on a segregated bus. The history books don't give her the same level of notoriety as Rosa Parks, yet her story of history maker, she was one in her own perspective, right? Then there's the little lady from Pasadena. You gotta see this woman, she's so cute. Her name, her name is Pearl Good. It said that when Billy Graham would do his crusades in Pasadena years ago, he accredited the, accredited the success of his events to this little lady who days and hours would just host prayer meetings and events in her home. Some type of way, Billy Graham caught wind of what she was doing and flew her out to Pasadena and asked her to be a part of his prayer events. And this is what he was said right here. It says, 56 years of Billy Graham's ministry was accredited to prayer. 56 years of the secret of Billy Graham's ministry until God utilized this woman. She had been praying 56 years, and God then brought her to the forefront. And when she passed away at the precious age of 90 years old, Ruth Graham attended a funeral and had this to say, here lie the mortal remains of much of the secret success of Bill's ministry. See, obedience that is done with the right motives will always catch the attention of God and others. You don't have to worry about fanning your own flame. God has enough power to do that on his own. And what would happen, just think about this, what would happen if we played our part in the larger role of history? So much bigger than us. We don't have to have the big ticket name, Jesus already has that spot. We don't have to be the evangelist, the prophet, or the pastor, or missionary. What if we just say simply yes to obedience and to what God leads us to do? Today, for the remainder of our time together, I want to focus on the third person. This third person, you probably heard of her, but nothing monumental that will probably stick out to you. I want to talk about Rahab today. If you could, stand on your feet. We have about 14 verses to read, so hopefully it doesn't make you too uncomfortable. (laughs) Says this, then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove, and he instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. 
So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. Verse 4 says, Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you probably can catch up with them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath the bundles of the flax she had laid out. So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crosses of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. For the spies went to sleep that night. Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. She says, I know the Lord has given you this land. She told them, we are all afraid of you. Everyone in this land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know that you did in Sion and Og uh, to, to two Amorite kings in the east of the Jordan whose people completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of courage in the heavens and above the earth and below. Now swear to me by the Lord, you will be kind to me and my family since I've helped you. Give me some guarantee that I, that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all their families. We offer our lives as a guarantee for your safety. The men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us this land. Can we make our declaration together? I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. This word is life to my body and health to my bones. I will be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And I'm confident in this, that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it. In Jesus' name, may be seated. Hey, listen, if I have not had the privilege of introducing myself to you, my name is Pastor Derek Hawkins, and I get the amazing privilege of serving as one of the executive pastors here at the Refuge. And I believe it's one of the greatest churches in all of America. Y'all believe that? I love this series, and we're in week three of the series, History Makers, and if you guys can, you can follow along with us inside of our app and take notes alongside of us. Uh, There are three things that Rahab did that changed history. Three things. Number one, Rahab did not allow her past to define her future. The second thing that she did was practice radical obedience. Radical obedience. And third thing she did was she had to recognize her hinge moment. She had to recognize her hinge moment. C.S. Lewis makes this quote. He says, history is a story written by the finger of God. Say that again. History is a story written by the finger of God. And what I take from that is that we don't get a chance to honestly write our own history. It's God's hand. If we allow him in our lives, he will write history in our lives with his finger. I believe that in Joshua chapter 2, after warning for 40 years in the wilderness, Israel was poised to take the land of Canaan, and the first city its sites was set on was Jericho. Joshua sent two spies into Jericho who went into the house of Rahab, who by definition is a prostitute, all we know. Some people don't know for sure if she was actively still prostituting or if it was a part of her past, but either way, Scripture defines her as a prostitute. She was situated right near Jericho. Her home was situated around the gates and the walls, the walls of Jericho, And God was going to use this flawed and sinful person, this life as a place of safety for his spies. See, see, history makers do not allow their past to define their future. It's clear Rahab has a few things against her. She's a woman. She is, some say, a Canaanite. And then she is a prostitute. Now, God wants to use her. He wants to do something in her life, but there takes something in her, in her situation to allow God to come inside of her life. See, our past does not have to define our future, but our denial of the Lord can. See, Rahab was a prostitute. She knew how unworthy she was. 
but the goodness of the Lord would allow the spies to choose her house out of all of the other places God could have chosen to take the spies to. He chose a prostitute's house. Let that sink in. This is how intentional the Lord is about the details of our lives. See, what does your past keep whispering to you? What are you allowing to stand in the way of your yes to the Lord? Shame, regret, condemnation, fear, divorce. All of these things can make you feel disqualified from God's yes in your life. If you read the story of Sarah, Sarah was too old. Paul was a murderer. Timothy was timid. Peter denied Jesus. There will always be something that the enemy attempts to use to keep you bound in your past. But today you got to make a declaration. My future is greater than my past. Come on, do I have a few people in here today? No matter what I went through in my past, my past mistakes, my past failures, my future is greater than my past. Years of my past. It's greater than my past. See, 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Come on, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Timothy 1 and 9 through 10 says, He saved us and called us to be His own people, not because of what we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. He gave us this grace by the means of Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But now it has been revealed to us through the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's the grace and the mercy of God. If you guys are with me this morning, in Psalms chapter 103, it says, As high as the sky is above the earth, so great is his love for those who honor him. That's all God wants out of our lives. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. If God can do that for us, then what power does man have over us? The enemy doesn't have any power over us. Second thing I want to lift up is this, that history makers operate in Radical obedience and the fear of the Lord. I don't believe that you can have obedience and not have the fear of the Lord. I don't believe that one is opposing of the other. You have to have radical obedience and the fear of the Lord. And God is ushering us into it. We can see it in the Scripture. Obedience means this. It means compliance with an order, request, or law, or submission to one another's authority. See, God is more concerned about our obedience over our sacrifice. Come on, is there anybody in here that can understand that today? God desires, what does He desire? He desires our full submission to the plan and to the will of God in our lives. And He can only do that, we can operate in our obedience, and sometimes our flaws get in the way of our obedience. Well, God, I can't do that. I've done too much in my past. There's too much going on. There's no way that God can use me in the state that I'm in. Here's the thing. God chooses to come into the house of a prostitute. What is your excuse? What is your excuse? Surely with all the unknown men going in and out of the prostitute's house, the Hebrew men wouldn't be noticed, but they were. And when Jericho's king demanded Rahab to turn over the spies, she bravely hid them in the piles of flax on her roof, telling the king's men they had already fled. Before there was one conversation with the spies, watch this, Rahab was willing to sacrifice her freedom. She never had a conversation with the spies. She invited them into her home. Not one conversation. Watch this. As soon as the spies got into her home, the officers came in to ask Rahab where the men went. So what are you telling me? Pastor Derek, I'm so glad you didn't ask that we have to have obedience before we have knowledge. God is not asking you to have the information. He's not asking you to have the details of the end. He's inviting you into radical obedience, and he's asking you to trust him when you cannot trust him. God is saying, I know, I know that it does not make sense to you, but I want you to invite me in. And that's what Rahab done. 
What would make her willing to sacrifice everything? And some people think you're crazy. You're going to church, you're paying your tithes in the midst of this economy. Like you're you're going to Wednesday night services, you're driving to Charleston, you're you're riding a bike 3,100 miles across them. Have you lost your mind? No, 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 no. God has invited me into obedience. It's an invitation into the heart of God, into the plan of God that we could not see. She didn't have a conversation, but she had an invitation. See, what would make her be, be so willing to sacrifice everything if she had not heard about the fame of God? She had to hear something about God that would be make her willing to sacrifice everything. What does she have to lose? Her family. She could have been ostracized even the more. She has so much to lose, so much to give up. Some of you right now, you have so much to lose, so much to give up. And God's like, man, you know, you, you can stop. You, you know, you, it doesn't take all of that, right? I mean, you know, you can you, just slow down, <laughs> you know. Stop while you're ahead. The enemy's been speaking to some of your mind. It's not going to work anyway. Right? The lies of the enemy become so loud over the purpose of God in your ear that you'll trust the lie over a voice that's been consistent that's never failed. Who have you been partnering with? So, she was more fearful of God than death over her past failures, over anything else. Proverbs uh, chapter 9 and 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Some of us are more fearful over people than we are of God. (laughs) Some of us are more afraid of the system of the world than, than trusting in the kingdom of God. I recently heard an interview John Bevere had with Sid Roth. Some of you guys might have saw it. And he went to, to visit Jim Baker in prison. And Jim Baker was a very famous televangelist, him and his wife, Tammy Faye Baker. And, 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 and he goes in and John Bevere has a conversation with him behind the prison cells. And he was talking about these encounters that he had with the Lord. And, he, and John Bevere asked a question to Jim Baker. He says, so when did you fall out of love with God? He says, when did you stop loving him? He says, what are you talking about? I said, no, no, man, no, no, we heard about the affairs. We, we heard about all the things that you've done. Tell me, when did you stop loving God? He says, what are you talking about? John, I never stopped loving God. I just stopped fearing him. There's something about the righteous fear of the Lord. That I believe that we have people that says, I I talk to them all the time, I'm sure you do too. I love the Lord. But do you love him enough to lay down your life for him? Do you love him enough to get your agenda out of the way so that his plan can be fulfilled in your life? Do you love him a way to get up your comfort and your sin to faithfully obey him? Because it's not love until you fear him. This woman had a revelation. Deuteronomy 11 and 1 says, love the Lord your God and keep his requirements. You can't love God and not keep his requirements, his decrees and his laws and his commands. And we are in a generation that wants one without the other. We want love, but we don't want correction. We want love, but we don't want chastisement. We want love, but we don't want to follow all the commands, some of the commands, the commands that make us feel comfortable. That's the commands that we adhere to, but we don't get a chance to pick and choose God's laws. We don't get a chance to pick and choose God's laws. Tell your neighbor, say she had a revelation. She had a revelation. Rahab had a revelation. What would happen if we had a revelation of God's holiness? What would happen 
if we didn't just get a nice sermon packaged in three songs of worship and lift our hands and sit down, I'm sorry, guys, and sit down and take our seats and then go back out and do it again on Sunday, and then we come back and turn around again. It's like, oh, man, I did it. I did the check. I did the thing. You know, I really did. I, I did it. And I felt goosebumps and everything while I was doing it. Goosebumps don't lead to transformation. Encounters do. Encounters lead. Encounters lead to transformation. What am I saying, Pastor Derek? I don't know. Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 says this. It lays it out. It makes it clear. She says, I know the Lord has given you this land. That's a revelation. She told them, we are all afraid of you. Now, check this out. For 40 years, the Israelites have been living in fear of something that was afraid of them. What do you mean? Your whole life, the thing that you've been running from has heard about the God that you serve. Oh, God, what would happen if we would stop running in fear for what the enemy is afraid of us, the power that we hold? Come on, the power of God, the anointing of God, the Spirit of God. What would happen if we would stop running in fear from what they have already heard about your God? Let me, let me back it up with Scripture. I'm glad you didn't ask me to. I'm going to give it to you anyway. Since we have heard of how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea. Meaning, the gossip of your God is happening around. Come on, America, I need you to wake up. The gossip of our God is going around the world. So what are we fearful of when we have a God that still is undefeated? He's never lost a battle. I heard a songwriter say, and he never will. He's never lost a battle. He says this, he says, and we know what you did to Sion and Og, ah, to the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. And, and this is the revelation. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear because no one, no one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. You've been running, and they're running from you. I want you to let that sink in. You have more power than what you know. You have more authority than the enemy wants you to think that you have. So you don't have to live in fear of depression or anxiety or your past mistakes. You don't have to live in fear of what the enemy's been whispering to your mind. You don't have to live in fear of what the enemy is telling you that you'll never do. You'll be just like your family member. The devil is a lie. I bind every single word curse that the enemy's been speaking over your life. Every single thing that the enemy's been saying to you, it will not work. So is this, no one has the courage to fight out to hear such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. She had a revelation. And she knew when the spies came to her house, I know their God. And before I would reject them, I will make covenant with them. Whew. Before I will reject them, I will come into an agreement with them. He says this, he says, obedience is the invitation that God uses to invite us into history-defining moments. It is obedience. It's not your resume. It's not your preaching and singing ability. It's not how good you smell. You guys look amazing, by the way. I want to tell you, you look awesome. But none of that matters if you don't obey the Lord. If you don't obey the Lord. See... Rahab did not have to participate in what the spies asked. She was moved by what she heard about the God of Israel. It says that night as the spies were safely hidden on the roof, Rahab made a bold claim and request. She says, we know the Lord is giving you this land. And Jericho is utterly helpless and hopeless. We know. But Rahab had one hope. She had one who was hope. <laughs> she, she had one hope. 
the Lord your God is God in heaven and above all the earth. She asked the spies. She says, will you do me a favor? She says, I know God is going to give you this land, but can you, do you mind <laughs> if you just spare my family? <laughs> see, see, God gives us what we don't have the desire to ask for. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. I promise I'm going somewhere. See, see, see she just asked that God would spare her family. Our pastor just asked, God, let's raise a million dollars in a thousand houses of refuge. That was great. It's a great ask. God, I'm sure God looked at Pastor Jay and said, man, that's cool. That's really good. I love his heart. But I want to do so much more than that. <laughs> Come on, y'all. You serve a God that wants to do way more than what you have in your mind to ask. Your ask is literally too simple for God. It's like, is that all you're asking? A million dollars in a thousand houses? You don't think that I'm, I own the cattle on a thousand hills? I can give you more than what you're asking for. But it was cute. It was cute, you know. It's cute hacks for Rahab. She's it's cute. So she said, all right, uh, they're going to come and they're going to tear us up. They're going to destroy us. I mean, they're going to leave us unturned. We're not going to have anything. If you could just do me a favor. Can you just look out for my family? You know, because we can kind of be a little selfish. Like, I don't care about nobody else in. I don't really care about anybody else in Jericho. Not worried about them, not right now. Uh, can you just take care of my house? And, and, and then there's a part of the covenant that she has to keep so that the promise will be fulfilled. You've got to keep your part. You have to. There's no other way around it. Like, God wants to do his part. But he wants to change history, but you have to keep your part so that history can be changed. So, Hebrews chapter 11 says this, by faith, she's listed out of all the people in the, the history of people that were people of faith, you find the name Rahab, a prostitute. How in the world does a prostitute make it into the hall of faith? What? I'm like, man, hold on, let me read that again. Rahab, you know, Abraham, of course. Prostitute, oh man, that's, that's, that's a little bit out there. But that's for somebody in here right now that feels like they've done too much. This message is for you. That's for the person that says, man, I have this in my life, I have that in my life, I got that struggle, I got that issue, I've cried that tear. Come on, I, I, I've rejected God in that area. Here's the moment of grace for you. There's still an invitation for you. God Almighty, come on, I wish I had a church with, but 10 seconds would open their mouth and say, God still has an invitation for me. Woo! Still an invitation for me. It says, by faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped the destruction of the disobedient because she welcomed the spies in peace. She escaped destruction by obeying God and welcoming God in peace. Some of you are saying, God, well, I don't see it. It's not showing up for me in this season. Well, if you see it now, you don't need to see everything now. There are some things you won't see until eternity. But your sacrifice now is not just changing the history of your today. It is changing the history of your tomorrow. It is. It is. Last thing. History makers recognize his moments. His moments. We have to, have to know that when there's a moment that God is inviting you, us into, I believe that we're about to embark on one of the greatest outpourings of revival that our world has ever seen. I just believe it. You, you feel it? Can you sense that the Lord is, is doing something? He's up to something. And if we're not careful, we will let what we see around us affect what, what God is doing in the realm of the Spirit. And if we're not careful, we will partner with the lies of the enemy and partner with his plan when God's will is being performed if we don't recognize hinge moments. She says this in Joshua 2, verse 12, it says, Now swear to me by the Lord 
that you will be kind to me and my family since I've helped you. She said, can, can you do me a favor? She says, can you give me some guarantee? Can you just guarantee me this, this that, that you, you won't forget about me when Jericho is conquered? She says, promise me you'll let me live alone with my father. He says, we offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety. He says, if you don't betray us, we will keep our promise to be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. This is the history-making moment right here. See, Rahab doesn't just represent the Canaanites. She represents the Gentiles. Track with me. The Gentiles. And God is not just about to make a covenant with Rahab. He's about to give an invitation to the Gentiles. And some of you don't even know the power of your Yes. That people that you would never see are going to be impacted by one yes from a prostitute. God Almighty. If I could preach this all over again, the yes of a harlot. God Almighty. Jesus, what would happen if we were so over ourselves and so into his heart that it didn't matter what he did for us in the future? As long as we do what he tells us to do now, what would happen? Strongholds would be broken. Yokes would be destroyed. Children would be saved. Lives would be turned around. Hearts would be healed. Generations would be saved. Guess what? Rahab is gone, but you have an opportunity to accept the invitation. Somebody in your family is waiting for you to say yes. Somebody needs your obedience. Somebody needs you to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to cry out to God and turn your face to the wall. Somebody needs you to turn over your plate and say yes to God when your flesh tells you no. Somebody needs your yes. Somebody needs your yes. See, Rahab had rehearsed when she saw the Lord do in Egypt. Whew. She knew that this was her opportunity. And she understood the power of covenant. She understood it. That one hinge moment did not only award her safety and protection, but it solidified her security through salvation for eternity. It was about her salvation. Oh, Jesus. The Lord wanted to save her. He wanted to save her family. And he wanted to save other families that would be connected to her. See, God is more concerned about our names being written in the Lamb's book of life than history books. He's not concerned about your name really being written in the book and people saying, oh, man, this is great. This is what you've done. No, it's about his name and your name being written in the Lamb's book of life. There's three things I want you to take away from this message. If you don't get anything else, this crazy, loud, screaming preacher just said to you. There's three things I want you to take away. You're not defined by your past. I don't care what the enemy keeps telling you. You're not defined by it. You have to practice radical obedience every opportunity you've been given. And you never know the impact of your obedience. You have to recognize the hinge moments. I was reading the scripture. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and it lists the genealogy of Jesus. And it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brother. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amenadab, Amenadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. <laughs> history makers. Make history because of radical obedience to God. Obed. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. 
Obed the father of Jesse and Jesse the father of King David. Somehow a prostitute got listed in the genealogy of Jesus. What will history say about you? See, your obedience to God will define your history more than your resume. C.S. Lewis says this, and I'm about to close. If you read history, you'll find that Christians, that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. Rahab had no clue that 14 generations later, that one act of obedience would land her in the genealogy of Jesus. She wasn't trying to be famous. She just acted in what she felt compelled to do in the moment. And that moment changed her destiny and her history forever. Bow your heads. Lord, so grateful. Jesus, for the Spirit of God that I sense in this place, for your anointing, for the presence of God, for those who are here, for those who feel like they're in a hinge moment and, and that, God, you're calling them to a radical obedience with you. You're calling them into a place of prayer, of fasting, or just obedience to what you're calling them to do. God, I pray that this message would be a seed that changes the destiny that you've called for them forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, one more thing. If you're here and you're saying, I don't know Jesus,